spoken a lot about um, becoming attracted to silent film at the age of 10. Was there any particular film, was there any particular experience that made you latch onto that sort of area of, uh, of cinema? Well, I was sent to boarding school at the age of three to Crowborough in Sussex. And the curious thing was we never saw any film except when Dr. Bernardo's came to pick up the money from their little collecting box, which looked like a, a house <laughs> with a slot in the roof. <clears throat> and as a treat, they ran the most terrible home movie that they'd shot in all good faith. But I mean, even though I'd never seen a proper film, it got me here. I felt it was so awful. The camera was doing this. <laughs> but the first film I saw was actually a newsreel, the first grown up film. And it was four naval officers who were walking towards the camera. And the thing that struck me was the glow, the, the definition, the beautiful quality compared to what I had been looking at from <laughs> Dr. Bernardo's. And however, to show you how brilliant I was technically, I was convinced that the naval officers were going to fall into the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I was rather disappointed when they melted out of the side. Um, then came Snow White, and that was too much. The wicked witch, or whatever, wicked queen, or whoever she was. And I ran out screaming. <laughs> My mother had to come out and beg me to go back in because she wanted to see it. I moved schools, and a really awful one, also in Crobra. And the only decent thing the headmaster did was to show silent films ah. every third Sunday in the winter and these were Chaplin and I was mad about those because his leading lady Edna Perviance looked awfully like my mother ah. <laughs> then there was Harold Lloyd the only comedian who didn't have a moustache so I identified with him and his incredible perilous climbs on skyscrapers um, oh, and it was magic, but the curious thing was, it wasn't just the films, it was the fact that you could show, you could convert your home into a cinema, and uh -huh. you didn't have to build a concrete theatre in the high street, like the region of Tunbridge Wells. So I went on and on at my parents to get a projector. The only thing is, I got one but I hadn't said what sort of projector, and it was a still projector. Oh, no. oh and it was so disappointing to see this that black beauty, I remember, on, on the wall of my bedroom. Just stood there, and then a lot of text came up. Anyway, they made an effort for the next Christmas, and I got a moving picture projector, and I never looked back. It started me off, and those films started me off as a collector, and by the age of 11, I was um, answering advertisements, putting advertisements in Exchange and Mart, finding films I never knew existed, hunting down information about them, and generally getting obsessed, which I still am. I think it was because when you have nothing but the image, you make better use of it than in a talking picture where you can tell all that's necessary on the soundtrack. And also the audience have to concentrate much more because if they look away they miss something and they're going to lose this plot. So that was very exciting, the fact that they could use the medium more interestingly than they were in the 40s and 50s. I didn't want to be a filmmaker, I wanted to be a film projectionist. I wanted to show other people's films, and I still do. I get much more of a kick out of showing somebody else's film that I really admire than one of my own, which I don't. And, however, my mother was determined that I should become a filmmaker, and she bought me a camera and sort of gave it to me and expected <laughs> me to use it. And, so I did my best. I did a documentary about Hampstead, where we lived at the time. And then I, I think my mother kept on at me. Why don't you do a story film? Like one of those that you buy for your projector. <clears throat> and then I got 
enmeshed in the film industry as an office boy, which was a very boring job. And while I was lugging, carrying cans from the office to the laboratory, I started thinking about becoming a filmmaker. The average age of the film director at that period was 57, and I was 18, 17, and I thought I should do something about it. And one day, walking to the laboratory, a black Citroen screeched to a halt beside me. The driver jumped out, ran into a delicatessen, and shouted back at his companion in German. And I thought, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd been reading George Orwell's 1984 and John Wyndham and all those dystopian novels, and I thought, what a picture this would make. And I was earning four pounds ten a week at the time. It was ridiculous. And my mother said, made a terrible error and said, but darling, you can't possibly do a Nazi rally in Trafalgar Square. And I said, that is what I will do first, to prove I can do it. And it was terrible. And I did it again, and it was terrible. And then I did it again, it was a bit better. And then I found somebody even younger than I was, but who was an expert on the subject. And we joined forces, and it only took eight years to make the picture. Do you think having that experience of making films, making films as a director, influenced the way you approach re remastering films and no, restoring but, films? but what it did do, it taught me so much as a historian. You suddenly realize why people did things that were otherwise difficult to understand. And it made me a much better historian and much more sympathetic towards the filmmakers um, and much more interested in them. And so I started tracking them down. And some of them, lived, some from Hollywood had moved over to London and eventually 50 years, 52 years ago, I went to Hollywood for the first time and tracked down people like Buster Keaton and Mary Pickford and all the rest of them. And that was so thrilling, I can't tell you. The very first film I bought as a kid collector was a Douglas Fairbanks film. And I immediately wanted to know more about it. So where do you go? You go to the library. Well, there were, how, how many film books did they have in, in 1952? <laughs> um, there was one. And I really thought it was going to fall open as a picture from my film telling me what it was because the title was missing and a paragraph about it. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I just opened it and there was Douglas Fairbanks on a, a, a motorboat and it said the film was called American Aristocracy and it was made in 1916. And there was, it was his first big success. And as an office boy, a few years later, people kept saying, if you want an actor, get in touch with the Al Parker Agency. Ah. Now, I had looked up the cast of this film and the villain was played by one Albert S. Parker. So having a one-track mind, I <laughs> rang him up and I said, does the name Douglas Fairbanks mean anything to you? He says, Jesus Christ, Doug, I directed him. I said, oh, what in? Is the Black Pirate, the, the first successful Technicolor film. <laughs> so I said, I think I've got an early film of yours. He says, bring it over. So he was an agent in Mayfair, and I bought, took the projector and we ran it on the wall. Then we had to do it again because his wife was so fascinated, <laughs> she wanted to see it. Then we had to do it again because he wanted all his actors to watch it. We had Trevor Howard, James Mason, Hardy Kruger, Clive Brook, all assembled to watch this 1916 picture. Well, I told all of them that I was going to write a book. I had no intention of writing it. It was too much like hard work. But I'd written the front, the first page. <laughs> so I said I was writing a book, and they said, um, oh, what, what's so, what's so, I mean, the films look ridiculous, don't they? I couldn't believe it. These are the people that made them. But te being terrible prints shown at the wrong speed on television had convinced them that silent films were lurid, ludicrously um, antique. And it was my job to show them otherwise. And that was also extremely exciting to uh, put the people that made the film in front of the film. 
I remember one of them, when we got to the end of it, he looked at me and he said, I didn't know I was that good. <laughs> Obviously Hollywood is today the, the centre of filmmaking and it became the centre of filmmaking very early on. Yeah, but the beginning it was Fort Lee, New Jersey in the east and Hollywood was just a place for retired people who wanted a quiet life and they got, if they built a church, they got free land. <laughs> um, prohibitionists mostly, so when they drove a French roadhouse, a French roadhouse operator out of business, the building was bought immediately by a company from the east called um, Nestor and it eventually got absorbed into Universal Pictures uh -huh. and that was on the corner of Sunset and Gower uh, and the, it became the CBS radio building but that was the beginning of studios in Hollywood. Now the people who ran Hollywood said under no circumstances are we going to have um, factories here, uh, nightclubs here, roadhouses here, we're not going to have fil they thought of everything but they didn't think of motion pictures uh -huh. so they, dr they did their best to drive them out and most of the studios were several miles away from Hollywood and Hollywood just became a generic name but Universal Pictures was a long way from Hollywood. MGM was a long way, eight miles out to uh, Culver City, I think. Um, and of course, L Los Angeles was uh, that sort of distance away, over the bean fields. And the reason that the motion picture people went there was not just because of the weather, not just because of the Mexican border. Los Angeles was an open city, which meant no unions. I have to tell you that I was, grew up on American silent films, and French, and German. When I saw the British, I was really ashamed. They hadn't a clue. And they had to bring directors in from Hollywood and France and Germany to make their films for them. After that, when, the, when sound came in, the British suddenly took off, and you had some of the greatest films ever made, like The Third Man and so on. So I, have nothing but admiration for and the David Lean films oh, yes. but in the silent days they were relatively hopeless there were some exceptions Anthony Asquith, Alfred Hitchcock um, uh, Manning Haynes there were a few of them who knew what they were doing and did it very well and promptly went to Hollywood <laughs>